Hello everyone, this is my introduction video to give you an idea of what it's like to be the victim of a horrific crime and how the very institutions that are meant to protect you fail you over and over again. I spent 19 years with a sociopath who was openly controlling and abusive to me and like many domestic violence survivors, even though I am no longer with him, I still have to deal with his emotional abuse as well as live in constant fear that he will once again try to kill me. As you can see from the camera, drug test, and toxicology test on the table here, the type of abuse I am claiming is a little bit more challenging to catch and prove than traditional physical abuse. When someone assaults you with narcotics and heavy metals, it doesn't leave a mark or a bruise that is visible to the naked eye. In fact, when someone makes you appear to be choosing to abuse substances, people are less likely to feel sympathy for you the way they would a woman with a black eye. This has cost me thousands of dollars and damaged my reputation and health, as well as left my family torn apart and divided. I have posted a book free to read on Wattpad called Malingering, the Deplorable Act of Falsifying Illness for Profit. I go into much more detail about what I am talking about. I have also posted additional documents that back up what I say and the accusations that I am making. I write about things that I am not yet able to talk about. My ex told me a riddle just before he threw me out. He said, how do you make sure your girlfriend never leaves you? Put an Oxycontin patch on her while she is sleeping. She will slowly become addicted to the drug, and when she is not with you, she will experience withdrawal. Only she won't know that it's withdrawal. She will think that she is experiencing anxiety or that she is missing you, and she will return to you. For 19 years, my life spiraled out of control while this man increasingly controlled and abused me. I tried repeatedly to leave and had a family that encouraged me and supported me. I would last about two weeks and return to him no matter what he had done to me. I always forgave him and took him back. It doesn't matter what the chains are made of, steel or chemicals. If you cannot break them, then you are a prisoner. Our relationship was not over until the day he was done with me. Here's an idea of what it is like to have someone use narcotics to take over your life. Imagine you had a glass of wine with friends one night and the next day you began to experience narcotics withdrawal. You don't use narcotics, so you are not familiar with their effects and are not expecting anything. You could be driving, shopping, taking your kids to school or holding a business meeting at work when you suddenly lose your focus and feel flabbergasted. Then you encounter an everyday situation that all stress, although stressful, now it bothers you more. You may even overreact to it, losing your temper and blowing it out of proportion. Your children will notice and it will frighten them. You can't understand why your weight keeps fluctuating. You seem to be losing your looks. This all happened to me gradually over time and each time my ex would offer me an explanation for it. Slowly, I began to accept that maybe I did have anxiety and that I wasn't smart, but rather stupid and nothing like he kept telling me. Narcotic withdrawal is intense and it wears you down over time. You will start to feel as though you are losing your mind. You may go visit your doctor and receive a prescription for lorazepam like I did, only it didn't work. You will then reach out to whatever will lessen what you are feeling. This may result in alcohol or marijuana abuse. If you associate withdrawal with a situation or a person, you will avoid it in the future. My ex timed my withdrawal to coincide when I was with my parents. And over time, I spent less and less time with them. I became mistrustful of my own family, blaming them for the way I was feeling becoming increasingly grateful to the only person who made me feel better, never once suspecting that he was actually the cause of it all. This further isolated me from people who loved me and wanted to help me. I then gave my ex every penny that I made, leaving nothing for myself or even my children. He didn't even hold a job for almost a decade. When I inherited two pieces of property in 2015, I began to feel a sense of malaise that frightened me. I felt so weak and frail. Should I overdose or drink myself to death, my children inherit the title to these properties and my ex is the father of one of these children. 
As my son also falls victim to these attacks, I strongly suspect my ex wants his daughter to inherit it all. Adding to my fears and suspicions, three women who have gotten involved with these men from this family have already died from alcohol-related causes. Their stories mirror my own. Twice now, my son has been befriended by someone off of the internet and my problems have returned. Once I get rid of the person in question, the problems go away again. As the method of operation is always the same, it has led me to the conclusion that these men are befriending my son on behalf of my ex. What would you think? I have tried to complain to the police and they will not take me seriously without the support of a doctor. Even though I have acquired my medical records and paid for private testing, I cannot find a doctor who is willing to support me. No one wants to admit that this went on for 19 years while I went to doctors, hospitals, police responded to domestic violence calls, and CAS interviewed us twice. No one got involved then, and they won't now. So I privately filed criminal charges against my ex for administering a nauseous substance, and I was given my day in court to present my side of the story. It is every citizen's right in Canada to do this. You are allowed to gather your own evidence and present your argument before a prosecutor and a judge. This took up an enormous amount of my time, focus, and energy, and coincided with the first individual off of the internet entering my son's life. Not only did I not catch on to what he was doing until it was too late, he was reporting everything I did back to my ex. As soon as my ex found out about my court date, he went to the police claiming to fear for his safety. He made many outlandish and degrading accusations against me, one of which being that I was schizophrenic. Without providing any proof to back up his allegations, other than a video he had secretly filmed of me a year and a half previously having a psychotic episode while enduring withdrawal. A psychotic episode he provoked and filmed. I was immediately apprehended under the Mental Health Act. I am hoping to work up the courage to make a video further detailing everything I had to do endure during this 10 day period. The whole event traumatized me from A to Z and I have been mistrustful of both doctors and police officers ever since. Theodore, you're not in this video, okay buddy? You're a very sweet boy, but you're not in this video, okay? As you can see by the dates on the forms, I was apprehended less than 30 days after filing criminal charges. Both times my son met somebody off of the internet, the situations presented themselves textbook in similarity to the way the ex, my ex had taken over my own life. My son had experienced his withdrawal while he was with me and had it alleviated while he was with his friend. He then trusted his friend and saw me as the enemy. My son had shown up at my house with his friend and the police showing the exact same symptoms of crystal meth use and withdrawal that I was. And I voiced my concerns about drug use to the officers over and over again. But everything they were willing to do on behalf of my ex to me, they were not willing to do for me, for my son. I had to watch my son leave with a man who was as abusive to him as my ex was to me. And when I did get him back almost two months later, he had a 26 inch waist and spots and sores all over his skin. I also had to get him off of the drugs he did not know he was addicted to and cope with his lashing out at me as he endured the withdrawal. I used marijuana to do this and although I was successful, it was hell. No one would give me the time of day or help me. How would you feel if this happened to you? The second time my son met someone, I drug tested a bottle of alcohol that was left in the house. It tested positive for cocaine, MDMA, and PCP. I then set up a camera in my dining room, a room no one goes into or uses except for special occasions, and pointed it directly at a bottle of vodka. Unfortunately, my son found the camera and my sting operation was blown. He has run away with the man I suspect was lacing the alcohol, displaying all the signs of narcotics use that these bottles tested positive for. And there is nothing I can do about it but wait and try to talk him into coming back. How many times am I going to have to live through this 
And now that my ex knows that I am on to him, what is he going to try and do next? Wanted posters of this man went up all over Hamilton around the same time that my ex had thrown me out. A number of things struck me about them. First, this man had been a regular customer at the restaurant where I worked starting in 2014, the year my ex's brother moved in with us. The first time I saw him, I thought he was my ex. They are the same height and build, have similar facial features, voice, and mannerisms. They look like twin brothers. This man immediately became a regular at the new location I started working at right after my ex threw me out. In fact, he shows up at 6 a.m. every time I find a laced bottle, and he makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. The second thing that stood out to me was what he was being accused of in the subsequent article I read in the Hamilton Spectator. Taking over a woman's life and taking all of her money. She claimed she was subject to violence and not allowed to use the bathroom without permission. That sounds familiar, as did the health problems she described. Very bad infections that leave marks all over you. I was on antibiotics 17 times while I lived with my ex. And finally, the response she received from police officers who arrived when she called for help. My experiences have been similar to the way the victim described hers. Less than human. She was given back to her abuser. I was told to be nice to mine. I have met my ex's family, yet I have never met this man. Then I remembered a conversation I had with my ex's brother, a man I will call Joseph. He told me how he had once shared an apartment with his stepmother. My ex's mother, his father's wife. What he described to me was two people in a relationship, not a stepmother, stepson relationship. They both worked, went out drinking and to dinner together. And he kept going on and on about how beautiful she was. I could not miss how attracted to her he was during this conversation. He even told me that his friends found her attractive and asked about her. He then began characterizing her as an abusive alcoholic and said that was why it didn't work out between them, because of her drinking. Joseph told me many things about his past. What else was said to me that I didn't realize the significance of at the time? What else am I going to remember? And is this why I keep getting attacked? As I said in the beginning of the video, narcotics use and the subsequent withdrawal from it will frighten a child. Both of my children have been frightened by the behaviors I have exhibited when my ex repeatedly did this to me. They saw what they saw, not receiving any support, no matter what extreme I go to back up my claims, has made it very easy for my ex to manipulate my children to his way of thinking. He is the victim and I am the monster. Right now, as I make this video, they are with him and he can do whatever he wants to them. This reason and this reason alone is why the victim of a crime needs to be believed. Because when someone gets away with doing this over and over again, it empowers them. They grow just a little bit bolder each and every time, and more people become victims. The sheer enormity of what I am up against overwhelms me. This whole ordeal has cost me thousands of dollars, and I am still dealing with the same problem. It makes me so angry, and I don't know who I am more angry with. The people that have done this to me, or the institutions that have turned their back on me. This is a sneaky, cowardly crime, and it could happen to anyone. And that is terrifying. I just graduated from university when it happened to me. I have never used the degree I worked so hard for. I am hoping the world gets angry for me. I am hoping I get public outcry and that this nightmare ends. That the people who have done this to myself and my family are held accountable for their actions and that no further harm comes to my children and that we are united as a happy family the one that they have been deprived of for two decades. So I wanna thank you for watching my video and please feel free to ask me as many questions as you want because questions help me remember things. And because I spent 19 years being administered um, narcotics, I'm really struggling with my memory. I plan on making other videos. I spent 19 years with a very evil man and I have a lot to say about it. There's a lot of things that I can 
share with uh, the rest of the world. And I think the rest of the world needs to know this because he's still wandering around the Golden Horseshoe doing this to whoever he wants. And there's a lot of money in it for someone to do this. I mean, you take over somebody else's life, you don't actually have to work anymore. They'll do all the work for you. You've got yourself a slave. So I think that's a terrifying thing and I think that it needs to be taken seriously. And as a victim of something like this, it really hurts to uh, get ignored the way that I have. Again, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.